We continue our series, Bystander Effect. We've been going at the series for about the last six weeks, and we'll continue probably for about another six. And it has been a wonderful journey. And during this series, we've been taking a look at really the Great Commission of what it means to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Spirit. And I think by now, if I were to pull all of us here at Trinity Church of the Nazarene and say, who's in? Who is for the Great Commission? I think we would get a resounding yes, and all of us would stand up and say, yes, I am for the Great Commission. Let's go and make disciples. We would all probably agree that evangelism is important. And we've also talked about that how oftentimes in evangelism and when it comes to living out the Great Commission, many Christians are not really engaged in it. And that's why we've called this series Bystander Effect. Because oftentimes in evangelism, we're afraid. We're afraid of rejection. Sometimes it can get a little messy. Sometimes we just don't care. Or maybe we don't know how. And most of all, we become bystanders because we think, well, isn't that why we hired Pastor Steve? Isn't that his job and Pastor Tony's job and Pastor Sally's job and Pastor Tara Beth's job? Why should I do evangelism when we've hired pastors? But actually, the Christians, the Great Commission calls all of Christians to participate in and engage in the Great Commission. Not one of us. Let me say this. And make sure you hear me. Not one of us sitting in here this morning are called to be bystanders. And for some of us, evangelism might look important. And we all know it might look different. And we all know that it's important. We pray for it. We want it. We pray that it would happen even here. And because oftentimes we don't know how to participate in the Great Commission or evangelism, we often resort to a few different types of tactics. And so let's go through a couple of those. One tactic that we as Christians, and let me just say, these tactics aren't directed to just us here at Trinity. I'm taking a look at the greater evangelical church in America and how we often resort to participating in evangelism. So the first tactic that is often popular is the attractional tactic or the come into my world tactic. Here in this tactic, we only brush shoulders with those outside of the church when we have a postcard for a children's event and we say, hey, would you come to our children's festival? Or hey, would you come to our worship night? We hand them that postcard and we walk away. And oftentimes we leave that unchurched person with the impression that we only want them to come into our world. We don't give a care about their world. We just want them to step into our world. And if they reject our invitation, we give them the impression that, well, you've rejected my invitation, you had your chance, so now there's no reason for me to have a relationship with you. Here, we only care about asking them to enter into our world, and the only time we ever maybe talk with a person who is unchurched is when we have a postcard or a Facebook invite. The second type of evangelism or tactic that we resort to, which I really don't see here at Trinity, but it's good to talk about, is the in-your-face evangelism. This is often seen at big events and crowds where the Christians swoop in and they confront people one-on-one and ask them if they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and if they would consider saying a prayer with them. I had this experience just recently where I ran into two girls at Sears at the mall. A few months later, I ran into them at Whole Foods. And it didn't matter what I said. I'm a pastor. I go to seminary. I love Jesus. They didn't believe me and they had to close the deal and lead me to Jesus. Doing this type of evangelism is like entering into hand-to-hand combat with a battle of wits. When we do this, we engage the person as if we already know their story, as if we already know what their answer is. We become presumptuous and we try to trick the person to help them see what they need and what their problem is. The third tactic that I think is more of a quiet 
maybe not as outspoken directly tactic, but is still loud, is the change your sin first tactic. Here, we give the unchurched this impression that they aren't welcome into our doors or they can't experience Jesus until they first change their sins and deal with their sins and struggles. And once they do, then they are welcome into the kingdom of God. This tactic is often seen online in the blogosphere world, in our Facebook posts, in our tweets, where we make a statement against the world how we are against a certain type of sin. And instead of leading with love, of loving our neighbor, instead of leaving with, leave, leading with grace and forgiveness and loving God, we lead with judgment and we lead with sin. Change your sin first. And then we will welcome you. And I'm sure we could discuss a few more tactics that Christians often resort to, but the problem with these three that we just mentioned is they are exactly that. They're tactics. And we never really enter into the world of the non-Christian. And the problem is when we resort to these tactics, we never really rub shoulders with. We never really do life with. We enter into relationships with a stubborn assuming instead of a holy curiosity of where the person stands. Because any other type of evangelism or relational evangelism requires the hard work. It requires actually having real, genuine, loving, and authentic relationships with anyone outside of the church. And so as a result, sometimes it's easier to just be a bystander. Sometimes it's easier to remain of what I call a bubble Christian. So what exactly is a bubble Christian? Let me explain. And first, also let me confess that there have been seasons in my life where I needed to enter into the bubble. And there might be some of you where you're coming out of a certain type of struggle and you need to stay into the protection of the church world and you can't be around those who are struggling. And so sure, there are seasons. But what happens if we live an entire life in this bubble? So what is a bubble? A bubble is when the Christian becomes so isolated in their own world that they forget that there is a whole world around them of unbelievers who are in desperate need of Jesus. Those who are in the bubble have little to no contact with anyone outside of the church. They go to church, they talk with their Christian friends, they get in their car that was purchased from a Christian car dealer, they listen to Christian music, eat lunch only with Christian friends, watch Christian news, go to the Yellow Pages to look only for Christian businesses. We speak Christianese constantly, and we just do and participate in everything Christian. And eventually we find ourselves so far removed from anyone that is on church, we find ourselves in the bubble. And so as I thought and pray about, prayed about this this last week, I thought, what are the symptoms of being in a Christian bubble? So I came up with what I think to be the top 10 symptoms of being a bubble Christian. Bear with me. The number one symptom of being a bubble Christian is you have little to no friends outside the church. And maybe the only Christians that you brush shoulders with are coworkers or people in the marketplace. And even then, you know very little about them or their lives. Number two, every weekend outing and every fun activity is with church friends. Number three, you see worldly activities or secular activities and you turn your head in disgust instead of a heart to try to understand the culture around you. Number four, you view the unchurched as a project, and only that, as a project to close the deal. Number five, 
Your entire life has become so unrelatable to those outside of the church. The only things that you know how to talk about are Christian music, Christian schools, Christian sports, and Christian clothing, that when you actually engage a person outside of the church, you aren't sure what to talk about. Next, I'll pray for you becomes the knee-jerk response anytime someone opens up to us, even when we're not really going to pray for them. We just say, I'll pray for you and walk away. Next, you don't really have a hobby. Next, you see social media or any type of media as just a tool of the devil instead of seeing it as a tool to shine God's light and as a platform to shine God's light. Next, the only people that sit at your dinner table are church folk or the only people that you dine with and have a meal with are church folk. And finally, every sentence you speak is full of church jargon and Christianese. PTL, bless your heart, praying for you, and the list goes on so that when we actually have a conversation with someone that is on church and we say PTL, they look at us as though, what kind of acronym is that? So why then? If so many Christians believe in the Great Commission, believe in evangelism and would respond with a resounding yes, why then do we resort to our bubbles? And if we don't, why do we then resort to these tactics? I think there's a few reasons. Number one, we assume that we know everything there already is to know about the unchurched. We assume that we know exactly what their life situation is, the root of their pain, the root of their struggles, and we always have the answer instead of a listening heart and a holy curiosity. We do very little of exegeting the culture around us. We do very little of trying to understand that potentially caused the sin that they are living in. And instead, we as Christians are far too often known for what we stand against than what we stand for. And we often lead with what we are standing against than leading with loving God and loving our neighbors. And we assume that we have all of the answers because the reality is it gets messy doing relational evangelism. It requires us to actually do life with people outside of the church. And the problem is that so often we are afraid of what others will think. What will our church friends think of us if we find ourselves at that party? Won't my reputation be on the line or we just view the unchurched as a potential stumbling block? But the reality is, if we want to participate in the Jesus mission, and if we want to get out of our bubbles, it requires us to rub shoulders with, to do life with, to dine with, and to get to know those who are outside the church. The Jesus mission requires us to do life with those outside of the church. This week I read a very powerful blog post from a man who was writing about those who lead with sin and are so worried about their reputations being on the line. Listen to what he writes. He says, Jesus stood against extortion, yet didn't mention extortion when he encountered extortionists. Matthew 9, 9 through 13, Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus stood against violence, but didn't mention violence when he befriended a leader to a violent superpower. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Jesus opposed adultery and even took a hyper-conservative view on sexual ethics found in the Sermon on on the Mount, Matthew 5, but he didn't front sexual sin when he encountered people and engaged them. Luke chapter 7. Jesus didn't lead with the law. He didn't lead with sin. Instead, he led with love and loved people into holiness. And then listen what this man writes. Pretty radical. I often wonder what made Jesus so compelling to sinners. 
why they were drawn to him, as Luke 15, 1 through 2 tells us, I think it's because his cosmic love for people seeped deep down into the bones of people who were broken and battered by a sin-tarnished world. Jesus had few friends who were religious, conservative people. But he had a whole slew of friends who were thugs, fornicators, extortionists, gangsters, or people who were simply rejected and unloved by the religious elite. Therefore, he says, I want to be known for hanging out in the gay district in town, for donating time and money for people suffering from AIDS, and for attending parties that are filled with gays, lesbians, and transvestites. Why? Because Jesus was known for attending such parties so much that it tarnished his reputation. But Jesus didn't care about his reputation. He cared about grace. He cared about love. He cared about fulfilling the mission entrusted to him by his Father and energized by the Spirit. Let's take a look at such a story. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 21 through verse 31. Listen as I read. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as a guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the, G- but the Pharisees and their teachers of a religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. So here in this incredible story known as the calling of Levi or Matthew happens in Capernaum, which is a border town where there were probably all sorts of tax collectors there at their booth collecting taxes. And most of us in here probably already know the reputation that tax collectors had. They were a part of the oppressive empire that was taking more money than what they needed. They were getting rich and getting rich quick by taking arbitrary amounts of money. They were pagan, and they were unclean in the eyes of the religious elite and the religious puritists. But Jesus approaches Levi, the tax collector, one day, looks at him and says, come and follow me. I don't know exactly what it was that day that compelled Levi to leave his life, but I'm sure it was the love And he left everything and followed Jesus. And he was so excited by what he was seeing and what he was experiencing in Jesus that he sent out invitations to all of his tax collector friends. And they came. And he threw a party with them, with Jesus there. And so there was Jesus rubbing shoulders with the unclean, with the scum, with the impure, with the oppressors. And his reputation was getting a little damaged. Because the religious leaders leaders looked upon this rabbi and this teacher of the law, crossed their arms in disgust. Does Jesus know that he is hanging out with scum? But this wasn't the only occurrence. We see time after time in the Gospels, Jesus that is hanging out with scum. Or the sinners, or the impure. In Luke chapter 7, as the prostitute is weeping at the feet of Jesus, Simon the Pharisee crosses his arms and says, If only Jesus knew what kind of woman is weeping at his feet, he wouldn't be allowing this. And Jesus looked at her with compassion and love and forgiveness. And says, your sins have been forgiven. Go in peace. And sin no more. And time and time again, we see Jesus doing life with, rubbing shoulders with, eating with. Those people. And Jesus didn't care 
what others thought. Because Jesus' meal with the outcast shows his interest in building a relationship with the lost over and against respectability. And we are surrounded by people today who are in desperate need of the divine physician's touch. And a lot of our tactics are failing. By the grace of God, and in spite of us, many times they do work. But our culture is shifting. Our culture is changing. They want to be heard. And who of us will rub shoulders with them? Who of us will listen to them? Who of us will dine with them and party with them? Tony Campolo, a very well-known pastor, shares a very popular story that many of you have probably even heard about a birthday party that he threw for prostitutes. Tony Campolo traveled to Honolulu, Hawaii, and because of the drastic time change where he was from Pennsylvania to Honolulu, he was up and ready for breakfast at 3.30 in the morning. So at 3.30 in the morning, he walked into a local diner, sat down, and began to eat breakfast. Just a few minutes later, about eight or nine boisterous prostitutes walked into the diner and took over. He said he remembers feeling uncomfortable because they were loud, crude, and boisterous. And as he listened to their conversations, he listened to a young woman by the name of Agnes announce to the rest of the group, Hey, tomorrow's my birthday. And one of her friends responded sarcastically, Agnes, what do you want me to do? Throw you a party? Make you a cake? Is that what you want, Agnes? You want me to do that for you? Agnes slumped down into her chair and lowered her head. Why you got to be so mean? I was just telling you. No one's ever thrown me a party before. No one's ever made me a cake before, so why would I expect that now? And soon after, they left the diner. And Tony sat there and found the diner owner and asked him, he said, do these women come in here every night? And the diner owner responded, every night. They're here, 3.30 a.m., right on the dot. And Tony said, do you think that we could throw a party for Agnes? because tomorrow is her birthday. And the diner owner went back and grabbed his wife and said, this guy wants to throw a party for Agnes. And so they began to plan the party and Tony said, I'll buy the streamers, I'll make the cake. And the diner owner said, stop right there. I'm the cake maker. I'll make the cake. And so Tony went out the next day and bought streamers and decorations and balloons and got there early by 2.30 in the morning and decorated the diner. And somehow word had gotten out that they were going to throw a party for Agnes. And so 50 of Agnes's friends from the street showed up and crowded the diner. And when Agnes and her eight other prostitute friends walked into the diner, the crowd erupted. Surprise! Happy birthday, Agnes! She was flabbergasted. Her jaw dropped to the floor, her eyes began to well up with tears, and she had to grab onto another friend as she could hardly stand. And they brought her the cake and sat it in front of her and sang happy birthday to her and lit the candles. And they said, blow out the candles, Agnes, blow out the candles. And she blew them out. And they said, cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. And she grabbed the cake and pulled it closer to herself and stared at it. And she said, can I, just, can I just keep the cake a little bit longer? And then she said, can I just take the cake home? I promise I'll come right back for my party, but can I just take the cake home? I promise that I'll be right back. And so she ran home and took the cake home. And while she ran off, Tony decided, can I pray for Agnes? And there with 50 other of her street friends, they prayed for Agnes. And when Tony was done, the diner owner looked at him and said, you didn't tell me you were a preacher, man. What kind of church do you go to? And Tony said, 
I go to a church that throws parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. Diner owner responded, no, you don't. I want to go to a church like that. And wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all love to go to a church that throws parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning? Because isn't that exactly the type of church that Jesus came to launch? Let's pray. Father, we confess that although we are often eager, we often have a stubborn assuming that we know how to do this. And that we often resort to our bubbles in fear. I pray that Trinity Church of the Nazarene would be known as a church that throws parties for the outcast, the sinner, the broken, so that when we encounter them, that we would lead with love, with grace, and the light and hope of Jesus Christ instead of leading with condemnation and sin. I pray that we would be a church that through the power of your Holy Spirit that the lost would be found. In your name we pray. Amen.